if they are specifically for a discursive, you want to make it obvious that it's a discursive. So you've got to be careful in thinking that, oh, my imaginative is really an imaginative discursive. Like, you know, like, what does that mean? It's like you have to really highlight, especially in the opening of your piece. So we're going to practice doing a few different openings at, in one of the exercises where you emphasize the features that are typical of that particular text type. Does that make sense? So even if you have an imaginative that's super compatible with discursive, that's awesome if you've got that because now you basically have two in one, right? But what I would say is if you get asked a specific form, not an option, so if they give you an option, the hybrid thing is perfect. But if they say specifically a discursive and you've got an imaginative which is like a discursive, you now need to highlight from the outset, you need to overemphasize the discursive parts, right? So the contemplative thoughts, the stream of consciousness of the, comp of the speaker, for instance, right? It shouldn't sound like it has a plot. What, what, it, what, it, what that means is it just makes the discursive version of it easy to do, but I'm saying to o just add no, be conscious of and practice doing a few extra elements that are going to make it clear to the marker that you're not right in imaginative if you are asked specifically for a discursive. Okay. So, so a couple of adjustments is what I'm saying, just to make it extra obvious. Because people can get marked down if the teacher thinks, oh, they've just come in and written a pre-prepared imaginative and we asked for a discursive, you're going to get marked down, right? So that's a risk. So I'm just saying prevent the risk of it, even though it may be true that you really did have a discursive imaginative, right? Yeah. The point is not to take any chances with the marker. That's, that's where I'm coming from. You can't be asked one of the 19 texts because schools are only required to study two prescribed texts, right? So they, could, they can ask you to choose two of the Module C texts at most, but because schools aren't required to present more than two to you, you can't be asked for a specific Module C prescribed text for the whole state. Having said that, someone asked yesterday about trials, and if your school is writing your trials paper, then they may choose to do that. So that, do you see the exception though? So in the HSC, they will not ask for a specific prescribed text because not everyone studied the same text and you didn't have to. But if for your trials, your school could specify a text in which case you want to look for overlapping, if, if there are, overlapping stylistic elements in those texts or at least be acquainted with the different stylistic elements from the two or three texts that you studied at school. Most people would have done two or three, okay? And then you would look at those, study those stylistic elements, the key two, and practice using them still in that core draft that you have. I mean, unfortunately, there's no easy uh, you know shortcut to doing all of these you know with the kind of hypothetical you presented there practice is actually what's going to prepare you for that you need to practice doing a write out to the hardest question you could think of which is often the thing that's most specific to a text so uh, I, i'm going to give you some hopefully some good guidelines to help you prepare the, mo the models the drafts for it but at the end of the day you will need to do a fair bit of practice i would be practicing for this more than any other section actually in terms of the 20 mark allocations, I would spend the most time on the craft of writing just because that has the most uncertainty with the type of task that you could be given. All right, so that was the composition. Hopefully you're clear on that kind of drafting process. One core draft with two variations for the other two forms. Okay, overemphasize the things that are unique to those forms so that it's clear to the marker. That's also what we've covered. So if it's a persuasive, if it's a persuasive, right, and you prepared an imaginative, what's something you could do to begin the persuasive so it's super obvious that it's a persuasive you're writing? Uh, yeah, no, not all that's exactly it. Because rhetorical questions are very clearly aligned with the persuasive kind of rhetoric, right? So if you are trying to persuade someone, you often will ask a rhetorical question. You wouldn't necessarily see that a lot in an imaginative. So that's the kind of feature I'm talking about. That's the kind of thing you can open with. Even if the rest of it goes more into that hybrid kind of form, at least in the first opening, in the opening paragraph and occasionally throughout, have those really obvious techniques that are aligned with that text type. How else, what else would sound like a, a speech or a persuasive kind of essay? Facts? Be factual. I went to, it's, obviously, you're not meant to know all of these facts going into the persuasive, right? So you can certainly, you could make things up. It is, you know, it is a creative task. So ironically, you can make up the facts, right? But you want to sound factual, right? In the last decade, this has happened. You know, a little bit more objective. That's going to help you sound persuasive as well. Also, if you're sounding factual, you're creating some kind of uh, logic in your argument. You're, you're bringing on evidence 
from the real world, what's that called in the persuasive form? Does anyone know? Logos, right? It's like logic. So it's like having a rational argument. You don't have to have all of these. These are just options. You can have logos, which is like logic. So you bring in some like factual evidence. And that, don't, that might only be one or two sentences, by the way. So you could have that. We said rhetorical questions. The other one is ethos. What's that? So you establish credibility. What's an example of a sentence at the start of your persuasive that could create credibility? Does someone have an example? You could refer to time and imply that you've been doing something for a long time. Does that make sense? So for the last 30 years, I have been studying this, this area. Because then to the speaker, it makes me sound like I'm someone who can be relied upon in my argument. Why should they listen to me persuade them? Why, why am I going to be persuasive? Because I'm someone you should listen to because I'm someone who has experience. So you imply that early on. Pathos? Okay, great. And that is appealing to the emotions. It's an emotional appeal. So we're just running through some general elements that I would be looking to incorporate into that persuasive adaptation that you do, okay? So you, can you all envisage the drafting process now? You're going to make sure you've got your core draft, which is your preferred form, and then say that that was not persuasive. You now need to make a persuasive variation. And when you draft up that variation, even though you're going to speak about the same thing and you're going to incorporate the, the same elements, you're going to make sure you've changed the evidence and the general style so that it fits this format. Yeah.